Our unison prayer for illumination is printed in the bulletin. Let us read together. Gracious God, as we turn to your word for us, may the spirit of God rest upon us. Help us to be steadfast in our hearing, in our speaking, in our believing, and in our living. Amen. Our New Testament reading this morning is from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 8 through 25, and you can follow along in the Pew Bibles on page 1,871. Hear the word of the Lord. First he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, Here I am. I have come to do your will. He set aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when the priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them, After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed up with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So be the word of the Lord. Thank you, Bob. And our gospel reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, Verses 13 to 28. What in the world is that doing there? Okay. Let us continue to listen as God continues to speak from his word. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone he was the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples <clears throat> excuse me, that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. 
Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Whoever, um, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny, okay. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Well, the sermon is, because we have, so we will. And we're talking about membership in the body of Christ and in the local body of Christ. I think it's been a few years since the church has looked at its roles and said, okay, you know, who's here and who isn't here? So we're going to talk about all that. So there was a church on an island. A man was marooned on an island for about five years. After he had been there for that period of time, he was rescued. And as he was climbing into the boat, they looked and they saw three huts on the island. And they said to him, we thought you were alone. Why are there three huts? And he says, oh, that one was my house and that one was my church. And they said, well, what about the third one? He says, oh, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> Traditionally, the season of Lent is a time of prayer and fasting, of introspection and discipleship. Individuals wanting to join the church went through a time of training um, concerning their faith, concerning doctrine, and concerning the church itself before being welcomed as members on Easter Sunday. Today we're beginning a Lenten series on the church, asking questions like, what is the church? You know, the big one, the universal church. How do I become a member of the church, the big church, the body of Christ? And what about this church? Does being a member mean more than my name on a list? A friend, um, a, a friend was telling me that as he was coming out of church, there was a gentleman in front of him, and the pastor was at the door shaking hands, as he always was. And so when this gentleman came up, the pastor took his hand and pulled him aside and said, friend, you need to join the army of the Lord. And the man replied, well, pastor, I'm already in the army of the Lord. And the pastor questioned him, then how come I only see you at Christmas and Easter? He whispered back, I'm in the secret service. <laughs> Some join a church because they're seeking an answer to their needs and broken hearts. Some because something is missing in their lives, because they recognize they can't make it on their own, because they're lonely and need someone to help them out, and maybe because they're thankful for the work God has done and is, is doing in their lives, and they want to make a difference in the lives of others. But for some, membership in the church has become much like joining Costco or Sam's Club. They get what they want and they go home or go somewhere else when they can't find what they want. Some join a church because they like the music or the preacher. Some join a church because they feel good when they leave, their guilt put off temporarily so they can feel comfortable until the next time they walk in the doors. Some join a church much as they would a country club, relishing the contacts and the networking they can do there. Now, if you came to me after church, and if you're not a member, and you can do this, by the way, if you're not a member, 
I would ask you and told me you wanted to join the church, I would probably ask you a few questions and we would have a class and talk about membership in the church. So these next five weeks, we will review what it means to be a member of the church, the body of Christ, as well as a local church as we journey towards the cross and the empty tomb. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your invitation to be your children, to be a part of your body, and to serve you. As we look into your word today, O oh God, fill our hearts with your spirit, fill our hearts with your love, fill our hearts with your conviction. Call us farther upon the road of discipleship as we serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the author of Hebrews recaps Jesus' work for each of us. Number one, he says that Jesus made the way for us to enter. Confidence. The feeling or belief that one can rely on someone or something. I think we've got the next page on that one. Is there? Nope. Okay. Sorry about that. It's out of place. So... Um, Full trust, firm trust, belief in the powers, trustworthiness or reliability of a person or thing. Com, from Latin, meaning with or together. Uh, fidere, for faith or trust, to trust. So confidence means trusting with or with trust, that I have trust or faith in something else. So he's saying to us, we have confidence to enter the most holy place. The author of Hebrews is saying we have confidence in God, or we can have confidence in God. Confidence that we can enter the, into the most holy place, even into God's presence. On earth, that's a reference to the temple and the tabernacle, and I have an illustration up there. The most holy place, the very center part. So if you see that little upside down T at the top center, that little part at the top, the base of the T, is the most holy place. This is a place in the temple and in the tabernacle, because God designed this, where the presence of God resided. Now we know the presence of God is everywhere, but for the sake of the Israelites and for the sake of us, as an illustration, God said, this is where I reside. It's where the Ark of the Covenant was. And that's where the high priest could only go in, only the high priest, and only on the Day of Atonement. He would go in to sprinkle the blood of the spotless lamb on the Ark of the Covenant to gain atonement for the sins of the people. Now, under the Old Covenant, our sin and our weakness separated us from God's presence. But now we have confidence that that separation has ended. In Mark 15, 37 through 28, it says, With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When Jesus died on the cross, when his spirit was ripped from his body, from its earthly home by death for our sakes, the veil that kept us out of the Holy of Holies was ripped in half, much like the separation that kept us from God's presence was ripped in half by his broken and torn body. And we were welcomed in through faith in Christ. So next, we talk about what do we have confidence in. And I put up there confidence in the little c church. And that's a question. See, I think the reason why we have a lot of problems in denominations and churches is that we trust in the church, the little c church, instead of Christ of the big c church the universal church. Rather than trusting in Christ, we trust in the people and we get hurt. In 2002, the Gallup Index of Leading Religious Indicators reached its lowest level. 
demonstrating the public's most negative overall rating for organized religion since it began in 1940. Now, I haven't checked anything since then, so. But at that time, the poll found that confidence in organized religion had declined. In 2002, only 45% of Americans said they had a great deal of confidence in organized religion, compared to 60% in 2001. The index reached its peak score in 1956. Since then, America's perception of organized religion has been in steady decline. So there are many reasons for this decline. However, a major one is that people complain that they've been hurt by the church. And in a way, that is probably true because the local church, as well as the church universal, is made up of people frail, weak, people who are learning to become like Jesus but maybe aren't quite there yet. We find ourselves hurt and disillusioned because we place our trust in people rather than in Jesus Christ. So if we don't trust in the church or in organized religion, and what do we trust? Only confidence in Christ and his sacrifice that opened the door to God's presence. I can't tell you how many times I have stood or sat at the bedside of an elderly person who was, whose time was limited and talked with them about their faith, and they say, I hope it's enough. I hope it's enough. My friends, our amount of faith, our works, our deeds are not enough, but Jesus is enough. So instead of trusting in our works, instead of trusting in our church participation, instead of trusting in what we do, we trust in Christ. And all of those other things flow from our confidence in Christ. But does that confidence require something else? Is there a place for church? And if we do believe in Christ and want to follow him, what does that mean for the practice of our faith? Well, number one, we know the high priest. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, that's in verse 21, we know the high priest. There, is, um, there was an illustration about a young boy waiting for a bus. And he was standing on the sidewalk waiting, and a man came by and thought, oh, this little child is confused. And he said, son, the bus stops over there at the corner. You need to go there. The bus won't stop for you. And the little boy says, I'm fine. The bus will stop. And he repeated himself again. He said, you know, he just had to help this little boy. It's like the Boy Scout dragging a woman across the street, and she didn't want to go. It, 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 he said, son, you need to go to the corner. The bus won't stop here. The stop's up there. And the boy said, it'll stop. It's okay. And sure enough, just then, the bus came by. It pulled over and opened the door for the little boy. And the man stood there thinking, what? And the little boy got on and turned around and said, I knew the bus would stop because I know the driver. He's my dad. <laughs> Not only did Jesus open the way to the holy place and to God's presence, but he became the high priest who offers sacrifice for us. We know the driver. Hebrews 14, 14 through 16 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, Yet he did not sin. And then he concludes here saying, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We approach God not with fear, but with confidence that Jesus is welcoming us in. Romans 8.34 says, Who is it who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Did you know Jesus prays for you? 
Jesus intercedes for us at the right hand of God. And 1 John 2, 1 says, My dear children, I write this so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, yeah, that's a, <laughs> I think we should say when, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. We don't go to court without an attorney. We've got Jesus, and he stands for us with the Father. So what do we do with his confidence? Number one, we draw closer to God. Verse 22 says, let us draw near with a sincere heart and the full assurance that faith brings. Having our um, hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Second, we hold fast to hope. He says, let us hold unswervingly. When those winds were here a few weeks ago, it was hard to drive unswervingly on the highway when those winds hit your car. But he says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, even when the winds blow. For he who promised is faithful. Third, we should be active and participatory members of a local church. And here we go. Of course, this is always after becoming a member of the church universal. Once we have believed in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, then we join a church, a body, a local body of Christ, that we may together do the work of the Lord. Verse 24, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So what does it mean to be a member of a local church? And what did the author of Hebrews mean by meeting together, spurring one another on, and encouraging one another? So we're going to go to the book of order here. The current book of order states this in um, G1.0304, the ministry of members. Membership in the Church of Jesus Christ is a joy and a privilege. I don't know about you, but I've known some, and some of them have been my good friends, who didn't think that being a member of a church was a privilege. It was something that gave them power. But this says it's a joy. It's a joy to be a member of a church, of the Church of Jesus Christ, and it's a privilege, and also um, to be a member of a local church. He says, a faithful member bears witness to God's love and grace and promises to be involved responsibly in the ministry of Christ's church. And then he it lists what this involvement includes. Um, number one. This is what's in our book of order. This is what the PCUSA believes. Number one, proclaiming the good news in word and deed. Um, it assumes we know the word of God. And these are printed on the back of your, your, back of your um, notes. It, this assumes we know the word of God. Proclaiming the word of God. This assumes we know it. Number two, taking part in the common life of a congregation. And this is attendance and participation, not just CEOs. You know what CEOs are, Christmas and Easter only? Yeah. It means that, and, and it doesn't mean you're at the door every time it's open. You have to be a church and, and, and do nothing in your life but church. But it means the church has at least the same priority as your other activities. Third, lifting one another up in prayer. Mutual concern and active support. It's more than just a Sunday morning excursion before you go to lunch. Being a member of a church is a weekly, it's a daily process. When I go home, I'm praying, I take the prayer list with me, and I pray for the people on that prayer list. And when I go home, I call the people I haven't seen and say, hey, I haven't seen you. Let's have lunch. Let's talk. Why don't, why don't you come to church with me next Sunday? 
Being a member of a church means studying scripture and the issues of Christian faith and life. So this is learning more about the word and its application to life through preaching, reading, study, and whatever else means. It means supporting the ministry of the church through the giving of money, time, and talents. I don't think I need to say any more about that. Demonstrating a new quality of life within and through the church. And that means finding peace with one another, forgiving one another, building stronger relationships, even when we do not agree. Responding to God's activity in the world through service to others. This is mission work, giving of ourselves, not just to grow our church, but to spread God's love in our community and beyond, even if they don't come here. Living responsibly in personal, family, vocational, political, cultural, and social relationships in life. Should I mention YouTube? Or not, I meant YouTube, I meant Facebook. What we post in social media, does that reflect our faith in Jesus Christ and our membership in the body of Christ? Participating in the governing responsibilities of the church. Well, I, I skipped caring for God's creation. My husband and I are having an ongoing relationship about whether I should be saving all of my recycling or not. Anyway, participating in the governing responsibilities of the church, not waiting till I retire to be a part of leadership, but making room in my life now, whatever the circumstances, to participate and be a mature leader in the church. And finally, reviewing and evaluating regularly the integrity of my membership Lost my place. And considering ways in which my participation in the worship and service of the church may be increased and made more meaningful. So the Book of Order gives Session the responsibility for re maintaining the roles of the church, which includes receiving and dismissing members, reviewing the roles of active members at least annually, and counseling with those who have neglected the responsibilities of membership. So this is what it says. There shall be roles of baptized, active, and affiliate members in accordance with, and it gives the numbers. The session shall delete names from the role of the congregation on the member's death, admission to membership in another congregation or presbytery, much like Shirley Pohl just went back to her old church, and we transferred her membership there, or renunciation of jurisdiction, which means they say, I just don't want to be bothered anymore. I'm not joining another church. Just take me off your list. But then it says the session may, and that's the word may, and that's what we're talking about um, with, with nurturing, may delete names from the role of the congregation when the member requests or has moved or otherwise, and this is the important part, ceased to participate actively in the work and worship of the congregation for a period of two years. This means they haven't come, they haven't donated, they haven't participated for two years, basically telling us, I'm not interested. But it also says, the sessions shall seek to restore members to active participation and shall provide written notice before removing names due to member inactivity. Now that sounds harsh, so let me continue on. So formerly the PCUSA had one more membership level and that was called inactive. If you had not been at church for a year, you had not participated, you had not donated, you would be moved to the inactive list. You were still technically considered a member, but you didn't have the right to vote in a, in a meeting. They still were able to get pastoral support and everything. And then after another year passed, then they would be contacted and saying, hey, you're not attending here anymore. Are you attending another church? Are you okay? Is there anything we can do for you? Do you still want to be kept on our rolls as a member of this church? And so they would decide whether they would be removed completely. Now, buddy, I'm going to need your help here. We, we currently have how many members? Was it 240-something on the active 242 active, and how many on the inactive was about 
180. Yeah, I, for, I, I didn't get this on here. So 242 active. Look around. 142 inactive. Under the new guidelines, those on the inactive role are technically not members any longer. That doesn't mean they're not a part of the church. It just means that on our role, they're not members, active members. Okay? That doesn't mean they can't come back on if they haven't attended for a while and they want to be considered an active member again. That's not a problem. It just means that what we have going on right now, and see the problem that we're working with right now is how the session will follow these guidelines that come from the national church. You see, many of those who are on the rolls are inactive or they're technically, they are inactive even though they're technically still listed as active. And for every active member, member we pay a fee called per capita. And that's a fee that we pay to the Presbytery and the National Church. And that fee helps them to run the programs that they run to support the local churches. The problem is that we pay that fee for every active member, 240-some active members. So the, the, the donations you're making are paying for people who aren't coming to church. That's basically what it's saying. And we paid, do you remember the amount, Bob, for per capita this year? 4,500? No, no, I mean overall. 10,000 and change. We paid to the Presbyterian and National Church because we have those listed as active members. So, the questions we have to ask are these, and I'm almost finished here. Number one, what benefit is a person who is not active receiving by being on the rolls? Now, we might argue, especially if it's a relative or a friend, that keeping them on the rolls might bring them back to church. We want them to be a part of things. We want them to know they're welcome. We want them to have the possibility of receiving pastoral care and use of the church. Actually, if you're a member, they do. So that's taken care of. Number two, are we doing anyone a service by keeping them on the rolls? Jesus continually challenged individuals to make their own choices and be responsible for them. The choice to be a member of a church is the individual's decision, not ours, not their parents, not their grandparents. It's their choice. And according to the Hebrews passage, an individual makes his or her own decision to be or not be a member of the church of God and a local church. I can't make that decision for someone else. Third, are we keeping people on the rolls to make ourselves feel better? Remember what it said in verse 24, and consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds and encouraging one another. Now, instead of keeping people who don't attend church on the rolls, so that we don't offend them or push them away, maybe it would be best for each of us to challenge them to be an active member, to invite them to come and explain that an, what an active member is and help them to make a decision one way or the other. Now, my children were raised in the Presbyterian Church, but they also went to a Baptist youth group. And I was hoping they would stay in the Presbyterian Church, but they both chose to leave. My daughter joined a Baptist church with her husband, well, before she even met him, actually, and my son hasn't joined a church yet. That doesn't make me happy, but I had to respect their choices and let them choose what they would do with their faith. This isn't about how much a person gives. This isn't about how often they give. This isn't about how often they're in church except that over a period of two years, if you haven't been here and we're paying every year that $45 or whatever the fee is, what do you want to do? We need to respect them enough to speak to them and say, what do you want? What is your desire? It's about challenging ourselves to be confident in our Lord Jesus Christ's sacrifice for us and God's openness to enter in and then sharing it with one another. 
Now, my friends, membership in a church has nothing to do with membership in the body of Christ. Except that you should be a Christian. And we ask those questions before you join the church. If someone's taken off the rolls because they have chosen not to be here for several years, that doesn't mean anything. We're not rejecting anyone. We're just saying, okay, when you want to be active again, let us know, and we'll just put you back on. That's all it's about. It's about challenging one another, our friends and our family, to literally be active members according to the guidelines of our Constitution and the Bible. It's about sharing the gospel and being accountable to one another and for one another, as the Bible instructs us. It's about challenging ourselves to be confident in the Lord Jesus Christ's sacrifice for us and God's openness. Now, many don't believe in organized religion, but to do the work of God in the world requires some organization. You saw that this morning. Some organization. We never withhold membership from anyone willing to be an active member as they are able. If someone is not able to come to church, but they're on our rolls, we're not telling them, since you don't come to church, we're, not, we're removing you. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about respecting what people's choices are. Now, my hope is that all those people on both the active and inactive list would be restored. <coughs> Excuse me to active, vital, participatory membership here or someone else, somewhere else. So here's my, my request for you this week. Please keep the nurturing committee in prayer as it works to update the information in our database so we can keep in better contact with all of our members and friends. If you want to help in this pro process, please sign up and want a voice, please sign up, sign up to be on the committee and to help us out. And as I said earlier, um, once we know who's going to be on the committee, then we'll figure out a time when people can get together. But for right now, we're meeting on Wednesday morning. Please keep the session in prayer as we look at these guidelines and try to decide what we do. How do we do this? That we might encourage them, the people who haven't been active in some time, to return to the church, whether here or somewhere else, that, and that we might strengthen that part of the body of Christ called First UPC Houston. And please, please, please speak to us, to session, to myself about your concerns. Don't just take it home and complain. Complain to me. Come to me. Come to session and say, but I have a question about this. In fact, I will offer after the congregational meeting to stay and talk to anybody who has a question that we can talk about because this is your church. The session leads us, but we are the members, you are the members of the church. And so we have to have open and honest dialogue. The Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, opening the way to a place we never could have gone, a place we would have never been welcomed into. We could not go into the throne room where we would suffer death and harm. But Jesus Christ died on the cross, and through that, he opened that gate. He opened. He was the key to the throne room and welcomes us in. He prays for us, intercedes for us, and now he leads us. So as we finish the service, and we move towards the uh, congregational meeting. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit would fall upon us anew and afresh, that God would give us peace with one another and help us to discuss openly and honestly as we go forward and with the interim process as we go forward, knowing that God has a plan for this church, and I have no doubt that it is to move forward and move up, that God is moving here. So let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the leadership of the PCUSA. We pray for your wisdom, for the session, the nurturing committee, and for each of us. Help us to work together. 
Help us to reach out to those, our friends and our family who are not going to church and to encourage them to come back, to be a part of what you are doing here. Help us, O oh Lord, to make peace with those who have gone, to help them to find peace, and if we are a part of a situation, to go to them and make a difference. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.